Okay, has it started? I think so. Uh, we can just wait for a few more seconds. Okay. This is showing. Yeah, certain... it's showing live. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and a very good morning to Professor Damrosh. On behalf of the team Calcutta Comparatists 1919, I take, uh, take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the 68th lecture of the online lecture series on this platform. Calcutta Comparatists 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences. It carries the legacy of the academic study of Indian languages and literature envisioned by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the University of Calcutta. Later in 2005, a new department was established which continues to carry on with the research in Indian languages. Calcutta Comparatists 1919 took inspiration from this history and it is a platform for sharing research interests and ideas. We are organizing online lectures on various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academicians and distinguished research scholars of different fields. Thank you for joining us today. Now I would like to request Aratrika to introduce our speaker and the moderator of this session. Over to you, Aratrika. Thank you, Kingsho. Thank you for this lovely introduction to our forum. A very good afternoon, uh, good morning to Professor Damros and a very good evening to Dr. Nanma Pramanik. Uh, we all know Professor Damros makes an introduction, but for the formality of our forum, I'll introduce him. Uh, Professor David Damros, Ernest Burnbaum Professor of Literature and Chair of the Department of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. He's a past president of the American Comparative Literature Association and is the founder of the Institute for World Literature. Professor Damro studied at Yale University. He received his bachelor's in 1975 and his postdoctorate in 1980 and then taught at Columbia from 1980 until he moved to Harvard in 2009. He has written widely on issues in comparative and world literature. He is the author of The Narrative Covenant Transformations of Genre in the growth of biblical literature. The, another uh, work is We Scholars Changing the Culture of the University, Meetings of the Mind, What is World Literature, The Buried Book, The Loss and Rediscovery of the Great Epic of Gilgamesh, and How to Read World Literature, and several other famous books. He is the founding general editor of the sixth volume, Longman Anthology of World Literature, and of the Longman Anthology of British Literature, he is also the editor of Teaching World Literature and of World Literature in Theory, and is the co-editor of the Princeton Source Book in Comparative Literature that was published in 2009. His works has been translated into various languages like Arabic, Hungarian, Polish, Turkish, Vietnamese, and many more. Some of his research areas include theory and methods of comparative literature and world literary studies, Bible and ancient Near Eastern literatures, modern European and global Anglophone literatures. Currently, his research projects include a book on the discipline of comparative literature and a book on the role of global scripts in the formation of national literatures. Thank you so much, Professor Danvers, for joining us today. I'll now ask our moderator, Dr. Menmar Pramanik, to welcome Sir. And before that, I'll introduce Menmar Sir. Dr. Menmar Pramanik is an assistant professor in the Department of Comparative Indian Language and Literature, University of Calcutta. He did his PhD from University of Hyderabad in Translation and Imagination of Indian Literature and World Literature. Some of his areas of research interest are Comparative Indian Literature, Translation Studies, World Literature, Dalit Literature, Migration Studies, Southeast Asia, and many more. Thank you, Menmar sir, for joining us today. Uh, sir, over to you. You can please introduce our speaker for the day, Professor David Damrosh. Uh, thank you, Aratrika Kingshuk and the entire team of Calcutta Comparatives 1919. Uh, I thank you for offering me this opportunity uh, to be with Professor David Damrosh today in this evening. And it is it is actually honor to me that uh, uh, I, I can attend through you, uh, Professor David Damrosh lecture in this virtual platform. And if I'm not wrong, Professor David Damrosh, uh, perhaps for the first time, will be speaking uh, in any platform in Kolkata, though he has delivered several lectures in different Indian universities, 
in Delhi, in Gujarat. Uh, I can remember in 2011, we delivered first Shishir Kumar Dash Memorial Lecture uh, at the Competitive Literature Association of India Conference in Gujarat. And then he delivered lecture in Hyderabad also. Uh, Professor Damdosh is my teacher too, uh, because I attended Institute of World Literature, um, uh, uh, Harvard University, and I attended his class. And it is uh, all, also uh, seven years, seven long years that I have been talking to him uh, with my ideas of world literature. And he's always so encouraging uh, whenever and whatever ideas I have put forward to him, he always encouraged me. Uh, today, I am a bit uh, sad also because the person who would have been most happy to see this event is uh, Professor Tutun Mukherjee. And it is our great loss that uh, because of her untimely uh, demise, we, we, we lost her and uh, she is no more with us, but uh, she definitely would have been very happy. And it is really a great pleasure and honor to all of us uh, who are there in Calcutta Comparatist and the listeners that we have Professor David Damrost, the most leading comparatist of the world, and who has been working throughout his life uh, for world literature, comparative literature, and, <clears throat> and post-colonial literature, and many more. Uh, so it is once again an honor and very good morning, uh, Professor David Damrosh, and very good evening to all the all the listeners and audiences who are there through YouTube and this Zoom meeting link. I welcome you, Professor David Damrosh, at Kolkata, uh, India. A very warm welcome. Now this virtual stage is all yours. Please, sir. Thank, thank you so much, Ramo. Uh, uh, it's very, very nice to be back. Here. Uh, I was actually first in India, uh, in Kolkata, at a meeting of the uh, Comparative Literature Association of India, CLI, in uh, 2007. So it uh, would have been very nice to be back in, in person uh, and to see you here as well as uh, formerly in Hyderabad. Uh, and uh, delighted to be uh, here again, even if uh, only virtually. So thanks to all of you for this very kind invitation. I am speaking today of a post post colonial age. I have in mind, of course, an analogy to post modernism which signals the ongoing persistence of modernism long after it seemed to have ended. So to the era of decolonization and post-coloniality casts a long shadow even over today's global landscape, economically, politically, in terms of literary production circulation and particularly in terms of literary scholarship. And my theme today would be that uh, we scholars who are interested in post-colonial approaches and in comparative literary studies uh, have much more to do uh, to, to take adequate account of the expansion of the global landscape of literary studies uh, and of literature itself uh, today. The challenges and the opportunities that we face in a global landscape are particularly strong for those of us who ourselves work in former British colonies, whether the United States or India, and who may now use the hegemonic global language of English uh, on a daily basis and in our scholarship. The dominance, particularly of British English, is decidedly a mixed blessing for us. Uh, in the US, United States, it has the persisting result, for example, that America has no departments of American literature, something that would be astonishing in most other parts of the world uh, for the national literature. When I was teaching at Columbia in the 1980s and 90s in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, we had as many specialists just in Shakespeare as in all of American literature. Very often, American English departments are the last true outposts of the British Empire in the New World. At the same time, the old imperial language can be put to new uses in the former colonies and can even be translated into new varieties of English itself. And here I'm going to share a screen for a while. Let's see. There we go. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back to this, uh, this question of what, what's on our map of world literature and what's left off. I'll come back to this map from Tolkien's world of Middle Earth uh, momentarily or in a little bit. Uh, but uh, the, the question of translating across uh, Englishes uh, came home to me a while back in reading this uh, parodic dictionary of Australian English called Let's Talk Stroy, published in 1966. Uh, supposedly written by Afrobeck Lauder, you see it's compiled by Afrobeck Lauder. This is not a real name. Uh, but a pseudonym. Uh, and its true meaning is revealed if you read it in Australian accent. The uh, dictionary's entries are arranged by alphabetical order from A to Z. 
The real author is the a graphic designer, Alastair Morrison, who illustrates his dictionary under second pen name for his alter ego, Al Torrigo. Significantly, it was a linguistic misunderstanding by a visiting British novelist that inspired his project. So we learned from the, uh, the preface to the book. It was recently reported that while the English writer Monica Dickens, great granddaughter of Charles Dickens, was autographing copies of her latest book as they were being bought by members of the public in a Sydney shop, a woman handed her a copy and said, Emma Chiswick. Thinking this was the woman's name, Monica Dickens wrote to Emma Chiswick above her signature on the flyleaf. The purchaser, however, in a rather more positive voice said, now Emma Chiswick. Eventually it became clear she'd been speaking Stroin and had used the Stroin equivalent of the English phrase, how much is it? The misunderstanding was due to the fact that Miss Dickens had never been told that while Stroins are often able to understand and read English, they usually speak only Stroin. Morrison claims, claims that he was profoundly disturbed by this realization. And so he compiled his dictionary, he says, for the benefit of visitors, students, new Stroins, and people who speak only English. Morrison comically presents his countrymen as poorly educated colonial subjects who are often able to achieve a limited passive grasp of English. And yet he doesn't truly stage an encounter between a tongue-tied subaltern and a metropolitan literary celebrity, the granddaughter of Charles Dickens. Instead, his scene plays on the Australian speaker's down-to-earth practicality. Whereas Monica Dickens assumes that the customer wants a book graced with her autograph. In fact, the woman is concerned with actual rather than cultural capital. She wants to decide if the price is right. And she regards the visiting author not as a figure of imperial authority, but as a saleswoman hawking her wares. A running theme in the dictionary is mockery of authority and the political rhetoric used to show it up, shore it up, as we can see in the entry, Gloria uh, Sarah Titch. Uh, Titch, Gloria Sarah. Madam Titch has always been a great favorite of Stroin elder statesmen, who often refer to her and their more exuberant exhortations, e.g., this is our Gloria Sarah Titch. We must defend it with your last drop of blood. Particularly nice is the old imperial phrase Gungadin, famous, infamous from Kipling, meaning locked out, as in, I Gungadin, the door's locked. So uh, as we can see here from uh, uh, Afro Back Lauder's dictionary, Alistair Stroins, uh, we're in a different political, cultural political world in which the old imperial post-colonial heritage uh, long after Australia achieved independence is nonetheless there as a kind of now resource uh, for uh, political and social commentary and sheer comedy uh, in the Australian scene. Uh, now, since that, that time, the 60s, when this came out, post-colonial post -colonial theorists have worked over the past half century at the intersection of philosophy, political theory, literature, to assess the chaotic world that has emerged in the wake of decolonization. And more recently, a growing number of theorists of world literature have tried to map this exploding landscape, which threatens to far outstrip any theoretical framework uh, whatsoever. Uh, here is three examples. Uh, comparatists of a post-colonial turn, such as Emily Apter in her book Against World Literature, uh, the Warwick Collective uh, in their book Combined and Uneven Development Towards a New Theory of World Literature, and Feng Chia from uh, Berkeley uh, in his book What is a World? on post-colonial literatures as world literature, have all offered a variety of attempts to encompass this new world. And they often critique world literary studies as complicit in neoliberal economics and politics, portraying a depoliticized world system, divorced from genuine struggles of subordinated populations, especially in the former colonies of the global South. For their part, world literary scholars have often implicitly, if not explicitly, built on critiques already circulating within post-colonial studies itself as being too bound up with a few hegemonic imperial languages and a few traveling post-colonial theorists located in metropolitan centers, refining analyses of old colonial conflicts but staying within the old imperial trade routes, which may not, no longer be so useful in the age of globalization. These divergent views can be found far from New York or Sussex as well, to take two fairly recent statements, 2018, by scholars in India, uh, Bhaidak Bhattacharya begins his book, Post-Colonial Writing in the Era of World Literature, with the assertion, and I quote uh, Bhaidak, the idea of world literature is dead. I should say that he is very much alive and has taught for the Institute of, of World Literature with great pleasure and great success. 
in, in the same year uh, in an essay in New Delhi's Open Magazine uh, entitled A Critical Conspiracy Called Postcolonialism. The prolific poet and critic Makran Panandrape considers, and I quote him, that postcolonialism is more dead than alive. He judges the field has been gradually in decline since the mid 90s. So my theme today will be that amid these critical and self-critical statements, fruitful conjunctions are increasingly being created between these sometimes a field, uh, opposed fields or approaches, the postcolonial and the world literary studies. At the same time, we have to be vigilant to be aware of a persistent tendency in both sides uh, to swamp the phenomena they are meant to account for or to miss so much of the world today. The radically divergent modes of mapping world literature today can be seen in two of the most often cited theories of world literature from the turn of the millennium. Uh, Pascal Casanova's République Mondiale des Lettres, translated as the World Republic of Letters, letters and Franco Moretti's uh, conjectures on world literature e expanded in, in other uh, contexts, other essays in his, his collection, Distant Reading. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, we have uh, Moretti's map is a really a network of nodes, no actual countries or boundaries as such. This is a, a diagram just of, of the play of Hamlet, but it extends the kind of thing he does for the whole world. Uh, Casanova's, uh, the, 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 uh, the cover of the paperback version, uh, the current paperback of her, of her book, uh, is a blank map. Uh, interestingly, this map is taken from an English work translated here, uh, The Hunting of the Snark by Lewis Carroll. Uh, in which the, the bellman brings a, a crew hunting this mythical beast, the snark, somewhere in the distant seas. Uh, and the map he has here is, is completely bizarre. As you see, there's nothing on it uh, except the markings all around. North is nice at the north, uh, but then we have next to it latitude and equator. Uh, the scale of miles at, at the bottom uh, is just a little line, means nothing. We have zenith, we have longitude, all things scattered around. This map might seem useless, uh, but in the hunting of the snark, uh, the crew is very happy. Uh, they, they exclaim when they're given it, what's the good of mercators, north poles and equators, tropics, zones and meridian lines. So the bellman would cry and the crew would reply, they are merely conventional signs. Other maps are such shapes with the islands and capes, but we've got a brave captain to thank. So the crew would protest that he's brought us the best, a perfect and absolute. Uh, in honor of Lewis Carroll's uh, uh, prescient uh, world literature studies here of an empty landscape uh, and my own persistent Anglophilia, uh, I have here a drinking tea, Indian tea from a Alice in Wonderland cup. Now, Feng Chia in his book, What is the World? Postcolonial Literature as World Literature, 2016, he has argued that we should throw out all these maps uh, altogether. We should take a deeper look at the concept of world itself. In his view, too many theorists of world literature take the world for granted, not as a dynamic field that literature can hope to change. Quoting uh, Feng, uh, who has also taught for us at the Institute, they equate the world with circular, circulatory movements that cut across national territory borders. They're primarily concerned with the impact of these spatial movements on the production, reception, and interpretation of literary texts, instead of world literature's impact as literature on the world. Close quote. In place of such merely descriptive cartographies, he proposes an approach, and I quote again, that doesn't merely describe and analyze how literary works circulate around the world. And in this, he would include Moretti and indeed uh, my, my own uh, prior work, uh, or are produced with a global market in mind, he goes on, but that seeks to understand the normative force that literature can exert in the world, the ethical political horizon it opens up for the existing world. He argues that sociological mappings advanced by Moretti or Casanova, portray literature as hardly more than a passive reflection of the forces that work in a global market. Not only, do, not only the literary work, he says, but the reader can become simply dummies through which social forces are ventriloquized. I think that his critique understates the complexity of the, of the relations that Moretti uh, develops between literary form and social formations, or the dynamism that Casanova ascribes to peripheral and semi-peripheral writers as engines of innovation nothing really passive at all in her account. She emphasizes the degree to which writers from dominated cultures have to struggle against odds that have long been stacked against them. She elaborates this perspective more in her, in her late book, Le Langue Mondiale, Traduction et Domination, 2005, which I also recommend. Hers is far from an apolitical perspective or one that simply accepts the market as given. 
But certainly Feng Chia's future-oriented uh, approach has a different valence than Casanova's present based account of contemporary writers struggling for recognition, and especially Moretti's fundamentally retrospective schema, really which goes out of his base since 19th century and modernist studies. Feng Chia sets his sights higher than literary historical explanation. He wants to change the world. And I quote, as an enactment of the opening of worlds by the coming of time, world literature points to something that will always exceed and disrupt capital. Close quote. For all their differences though, both Moretti and Feng Chia are developing a global vision that has roots uh, in a Marxist understanding of economics of power in a post-imperial world. At the same time, both remain highly selective in the archive that they assemble to illustrate their theories. And their accounts often seem to proceed just in one direction, theoretically from a European framework to the individual work. Uh, Feng Chia not acknowledges this tendency, but he insists that he isn't simply repeating an older Hegelian or Marxist Euro-universalism. And I quote, the organization of this book, he says, can give the wrong impression of, of a division of labor between the European philosophy and literature from the post-colonial South, where post-colonial literary texts had the subordinate function of illustrating the ontological and normative problems concerning worldliness that European philosophy elaborates. In fact, no such division exists. My analyses of post-colonial world literature are not merely examples of this theory, they inflect and deepen the theory by exploring concrete post-colonial sites where the opening of new worlds is the greatest urgency. I halfway agree that that's what he's doing, but I also think um, it's quite different after all uh, than a book would be if it in fact incorporated uh, theorists from outside uh, the, the, the German and French uh, tradition. It's a very European-based theory. And then, sure enough, the post-colonial Global South writers are deepening, fundamentally bolstering, refining, adding value to, to the theory. Uh, but he's not citing anyone from, any, uh, from outside Western Europe, theoretically. Uh, and I think in this case, we need to look much more deeply uh, into the challenges of cross-cultural comparison, whether it's labeled as post-colonial comparative, transnational, or world literary studies, to test our concepts and to open them out beyond the, the Euro-Universal Euro, Euro or Euro-American Euro framework that has been so dominant uh, for, for so long. Uh, to take full account of the irreducible variety of literary worlds means also to look for works that don't fit the, the parameters of the Euro theory. Uh, this is a key aspect of what Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak has called the singularity un unverifiability of literature as such, uh, as she says in her book, uh, Critique of Postcolonial Reason. This singularity can provide a check against the danger of categorical stereotyping. This is a temptation for any literary analysis, but it's a temptation to which comparatists are particularly prone. Specialists in a single tradition are more likely to have a comprehensive knowledge of the variety of works within their tradition of choice. But comparatists, have to be particularly alert to the danger of creating broad brush characterizations on the basis of a limited set of examples. The further we venture into a writer's own literary creation, the secondary creation from the world, the more fully we'll be able to understand how it reflects or refracts the world known to the author to see its implications for the world we know today. As Eric Hayo says in his recent book on literary worlds, Aesthetic worldedness is the form of the relation a work establishes between the world inside and the world outside the work. Even a novel set in a distant past or on another planet is always connected to the writer's world, however obliquely. But these connections can be conceived in very different ways. And the more closely we attend to a greater variety of literary worlds, wherever they're being produced, the more we can uh, do to sort of really uh, heal the, the, the rifts between post-colonial world literary studies and to do justice to this variety in the world. So we can see a very different world map from either Casanova's Moretti's or indeed Feng Chia's uh, in uh, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Tolkien. This is the map of Middle Earth uh, drawn by his son uh, Christopher, which is, appears as a fold out in the original Alan Unwin uh, edition. Uh, his trilogy is a striking example of a work that is at once ubiquitous in contemporary culture, but almost invisible in comparative and post-colonial scholarship. With some 150 million copies sold to date, it is probably the best-selling novel of all times. It's like three times the number for Garcia Marquez, for example. Uh, it is undoubtedly one of the most ambitious examples of world creation in the history of literature. It's also one that is shot through with warring imperialisms. 
certainly of interest to a post-colonial scholarship with waxing and waning empires that obliquely rework the national and imperial conflicts that nearly killed Tolkien himself in the trenches of World War I and nearly blew up the whole world in the early years of the Cold War when he was writing the novel. His works have inspired a great deal of scholarship, but almost all of it has been on the national level. As of April 19, 2019, when I last checked, the MLA bibliography lists no fewer than 2,880 books and articles that include him in their subject listings. These are written, however, with very few exceptions by scholars who focus either on his fantasy world or on his British context. Yet the Lord of the Rings can equally be studied in an international frame. It has periodically been discussed in relation to Nordic mythology and the medieval genre of the quest romance, but there's almost no discussion of Tolkien in relation to modern writers outside England itself. If we see Tolkien in international context, we can better understand his Englishness as well as his modernity. And it shouldn't be forgotten that Middle Earth maps onto Europe as a whole, not just England. To take the distinctive category of bestsellers by medievalist, uh, the trilogy has often been compared to the Narnia series uh, and the Silent Planet trilogy of his friend C.S. Lewis, but no one has yet discussed Tolkien together with Umberto Eco. Yet the name of the rose also retrojects contemporary political concerns into a medieval world, complete with intensive discussion of language in a world of inscrutable signs. Uh, in such a comparison, uh, we, can, uh, we can begin to, to situate a Tolkien in a different world than the purely English one or the purely fantasy one uh, that uh, is, is dominant uh, today. We're looking beyond Europe. We can compare his world to the mixture of magic and realism that Alejo Carpentier uh, labeled Lo Real Maravillosa in 1949, the real, the magical real, uh, at the very time that Tolkien was uh, engaged in writing his trilogy. So for Tolkien, it might be better to speak of maravillas realistas, realistic marvels rather than magical realism. But even with that difference, Tolkien's Shire is similar on various dimensions to the Macondo Garcia Marquez's Cien Años de Soledad, another invented world that both is and is not part of the wider world from which it is cut off. Now, comparisons are often made between Macondo and William Faulkner's Yoknapatalfa County, and for good reason, but there's little magic in Faulkner's realism. Far closer to Garcia Marquez's Gypsy Melchiades is the itinerant wizard Gandalf the Grey. Both perform magical feats. Both even return from the dead. Both are racially other figures who seem suspicious to local citizens. Both are masters of prophetic texts in ancient languages, Sanskrit in Melchiades' case, that few but they can read. Now a full-scale comparison of those two books would of course include their fundamental differences including the differential consequences of Tolkien's nostalgic conservatism versus Garcia Marquez's progressive leftism. But a pure opposition would be difficult to maintain. Both writers are concerned with the baneful effects of multinational industry invading their rural homeland, though Tolkien speaks of Saruman importing methods learned in Mordor, while Garcia Marquez directly references the United Fruit Company. Tolkien's portrayal of the totalitarian Sauron and his puppet Saruman could well be compared to the Latin American tradition of the dictator novel, which was inaugurated during the very same years by works such as Miguel Angel Asturias's El Señor Presidente, which has its own share of mythic motifs inspired by the research underlying his first collection, Leyendas de Guatemala. Now a comparison of Tolkien uh, to his Latin American contemporaries uh, and to European contemporaries like Echo, uh, would situate the Lord of the Rings more fully in its mid-century literary and political context, helping us to understand its remarkable worldwide success. The comparison would also underscore the fact that a mixture of the magical and the real is not a, the special province of third world indigene who takes flying carpets in stride, nor does it reflect some simply Latin American reality a neo-Orientalist claim that Garcia Marquez made in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, which he called the solitude of Latin America. As comparatives have often recognized, Garcia Marquez can best be understood not only in, his, in relation to his Latin American interlocutors in a post-colonial context, but within the supranational supernatural, super context of the post-war era and the modern world novel. San Años de Soledad thus forms the disenchanted conclusion to Franco Moretti's book, modern epic, the world system from Goethe to Garcia Marquez uh, from 1996. 
uh, which moves from Faust and Wagner's ring cycle to Moby Dick, Ulysses, The Wasteland, and Cien Años. Murati sees these sprawling works as what we might call, revising Gerard Lukács, the epics of a world abandoned by epic. Moretti's story could have been expanded in interesting ways if it had included Tolkien's self-consciously modern epic. In his Ring trilogy, he was rewriting Wagner's prior rewriting of Germanic traditions in the Ring Cycle, which Moretti discusses at length, but on his own terms. And Tolkien sought to create a myth mythology appropriate to the 20th century. Now he was out of step with the contemporary world in many respects, conservative Catholic devoted to lost ages, but Moretti gives equal space or give space to the equally conservative Anglo-Catholic T.S. Eliot. Tolkien's serious epic endeavor could have served as a valuable counterpoint to Joyce's and Garcia Marquez's ironic anti-epics. Now the absence of comparison between Tolkien and Umberto Eco or Garcia Marquez probably stems from certain widely held but too rarely questioned assumptions among comparatives, generally among literary scholars. For example, that popular literature lives in a different universe from truly literary writing that canonized postmodernists have little in common with contemporaries who are not engaged in rewriting Proust, Joyce, or Cervantes, that politically progressive writers form a closed and charmed circle into which anti-progressive writers are not invited. Yet such exclusions limit our understanding of modern fiction's varied aesthetic and political relations to the post-war world. Modernity has always developed in dialectical relation to various strands of anti-modernity, and literature can be modern without being modernist. Some studies have begun to explore Tolkien's relations to British modernism, but there's been next to no comparative work on him in a modern context. Garcia Marquez and Tolkien each have upwards of 2,000 entries in the MLA International Bibliography. Four dozen entries compared Garcia Marquez with Faulkner, there's not even one comparing him and Tolkien. To judge from his neglect by comparatists, Tolkien might as well have written his trilogy in Elvish. From Moretti, to Emily after to Feng Chia, the world system, as we've all been construing it, has not made room for the world's single, most widely read work of literature. If even so prominent a work of English literature can be so invisible to our technologies of recognition, a phrase from Sume uh, Shi, uh, the problem is all the greater for semi-peripheral and peripheral writers. Too many comparative studies in the last century oppose French versus German traditions or very broadly Eastern versus Western poetics amalgamating a multitude of writers with an imperious dichotomy. We don't hear so much these days about the Orient or the third world, but now it's common to encounter the binary opposition between the West and the global South. This term risks an even greater homogenization now on a hemispheric scale. Such stereotyping is usually blamed on the neoliberal world system, but it may equally be an artifact of the scholar's own selectivity. As Gayatri Spivak recently remarked, and I quote her, I think the global South is a reverse racist term, one that ignores the daunting diversity outside Europe and the United States. We decide to define what we are not by a bit of academic tourism." Close quote. As we know, such binaries are rarely neutral, but privilege one of their terms. Often a simplistic version of the less favored term is held as a constant against which to showcase the admirable qualities of the works brought together under the preferred term. We can see this even in uh, the case of such a progressive thinker as Benedict Anderson in his uh, seminal book, 1983, Imagine Communities. Uh, he brilliantly combined European, Southeast Asian, Latin American examples, and he created a far more level playing field for the analysis of modern literatures and cultures than had been typical before him. And yet his argument rests on a different stereotypical dichotomy, a secular modernity versus otherworldly pre-modernity. In his opening chapter, which is called Cultural Roots, Anderson proposes that the modern nation strengthened its legitimacy by taking on a quasi-religious dimension, giving an earthly and dynamic cast to the timeless imagined communities of Christendom, Buddhism, or the Islamic Ummah. He sees these widespread religious communities as raising ultimate questions of life and death, and he wants to show how modern nationalism grows from pre-modern religious as well as political roots. This is very important and good argument. But yet he discusses religion and nationalism in terms of very sharp historical divide. And I quote, in Western Europe, the 18th century marks not only the dawn of the age of nationalism, but the dusk of religious modes of thought. Close quote. This chapter is marked by this kind of dichotomous thinking based on what Anderson himself describes as perhaps simple-minded observations. And it always the disadvantage of the fatalistic, anti-progressive, pre-modern moderns trapped in a cyclical concept of time. 
in Anderson, Orientalism had been banished from modern Asia only to take refuge in the pre-modern world, whether European or elsewhere. And of course, as we see very well since 1983, religion has not exactly quite disappeared as a force in the modern world, despite uh, those kinds of claims. Now, all of us today need to take care not to reduce the singularity of works and cultures to some lowest common denominator. Timothy Brennan observed this problem uh, 20 years ago in his book, At Home in the World. Uh, a, a title I think reflects also the, uh, the title of Tagore's novel. Criticizing the emphasis on socialist realism within post-colonial studies, Brennan complained, and I quote, of a lack of interest in the explicitly modernist or experimental writing of those who are considered not to be political enough. <clears throat> those who do not fit the injunction that the third world writer embodies politics in a readily consumable form. This would be the process at work, I think, he says, in the surprisingly weak reception of the Brazilian novelist, Carlos Lispector, for instance, with their brilliant psychological portraits of love and loss. Brendan returns to the scene towards the end of his book, and I quote, in the space between the reading of novels, poems, and essays from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and the reading of post theory, much is missing. The massive network of emotions and sympathies found in the primary work doesn't always find itself exhibited <clears throat> in the criticism. <clears throat> now, commenting on this, uh, Natalie Milas, in her book, All the Difference in the World, uh, says, in other words, difference is not so different after all. And yet she asks, is it really possible to seek real absolute difference? Doesn't any object brought into the sanctioned discourse of the university by that very fact conform to some rule of recognizability? This is a real problem we all have to deal with. It isn't easy to expand a field of inquiry to works that are eclipsed by our own technologies of recognition. And yet scholarship often advances precisely by directing attention to neglected works that can refine an argument or reshape a field. In their recent book, Combined and Uneven Development, the work collective responds to Brennan's critique by looking beyond the norms of socialist realism in discussions of very interesting selections of novelists, including Tayeb Saleh from Sudan, the Russian postmodernist Viktor Pelevin, Slovakia's Peter Pestanek, Spanish modernist Pio Barretta, South African Ivan Vladislavich. They adopt uh, Leon Trotsky's economic theory of combined and uneven development and seek to move beyond a one sided Marxian emphasis just on social social realism. Showcase, and they showcase novels that critique the neoliberal world order and modes of what they call irrealism, combining elements of socialist and magical realism. So this responds to Brennan's critique and moves beyond. And yet the work group is still interested only in writers whose politics closely resembles their own. And they only look at novels that illustrate the theme of combined and uneven development that they have derived already from their particular Marxist tradition. Chloe's Lispector, whom Tim Brennan mentions as unjustly neglected, was deeply interested in the uneven politics of gender and center periphery relations both within and beyond Brazil, but she doesn't figure in their account, nor in fact is any woman writer which is a surprising mission in the work of a resolutely uh, progressive seven person group, which includes men as well as women. The work group is limited linguistically as well as ideologically. They critique much Anglo-American post-colonial criticism, but they don't really move too far from the Anglosphere in their actual practice. Remarkably, they do not list a single work of scholarship in any language other than English. And they never refer to the originals when discussing novels written in Arabic, Russian, Slovakian, and Spanish. This limits the group's ability to develop their analysis on its own terms or to fully situate their writers in their own material circumstances, starting with the materiality of language itself. It's symptomatic that the names of three of their seven key writers have, are spelled with diacritics, but they inevitably cite Pishtanek, Pio Beretta, and Vladislavich without the accents that belong in the S, I, and C of their names. Materialist critics without diacritics? Particularly when we study literatures beyond the Euro-American sphere, we have to be wary of cherry picking the most easily assimilated works to the exclusion of others that might challenge or complicate our argument. As an Asian example of a work that doesn't fit our usual scholarly narratives, consider Four Reigns, the neglected masterpiece of the important Thai writer Kukrit Pramod. Kukrit's novel describes Thailand's transition into modernity beginning in the 1890s during the reign of the reformist King Rama V and ending with the sudden death of Rama VIII in 1946. Kukrit was concerned with preserving traditional culture and values, even as he actively promoted modernization. 
He was a prolific journalist and writer, wrote some 40 books. In addition to novels and short stories, he wrote books in Thai literature and art. He founded a classical uh, Thai dance company for which he was a lead dancer. You see pictures of him there in costume in his early years as a dancer. He pursued his varied artistic endeavors during troubled times. In 1932, when he was 21, a military coup replaced absolute rule with a nominally democratic system, in which an elected parliament was controlled by the military and a small group of wealthy families. Cook reviewed the monarchy as the best check on military oligarchic control. In Four Reigns, 1951, mounts an understated but far-reaching critique of the new pseudo-democratic order. Kukrit was what you could call a conservative modernist. He was firmly committed to Thailand's development as a modern and independent nation, and he had no patience with exoticizing Western representations of his country as a timeless land of oriental splendor. His first book, written with his brother, uh, was uh, entitled A King of Siam Speaks, 1948. It was inspired by their irritation at the representation of King Rama IV in the 1946 Hollywood film Anna and the King of Siam which starred Rex Harrison as the king and Irene Dunn as a British governess who tries to wean him from his barbarian ways. The brothers show that Rama IV was not at all the hidebound autocrat portrayed in the film. He was a promoter of women's rights, a modernizer, who had sought to resist Western expansionism by developing science and technology during his reign in the 1850s and 1860s, very much in parallel to his direct Japanese counterpart, the Emperor, Emperor Meiji. One year after he published The King of Siam Speaks, Kukrit founded a newspaper, Siam Rat, meaning Thai nation, and he wrote a weekly column for his paper. His newspaper remain, became and remains a leading venue for political and cultural reporting. Amid his multifarious activities, Kukrit was also a playwright and actor. In 1973, he created and starred in a stage version of Rashomon, based on Akira Kurosawa's film. A decade earlier, he had co-starred with Marilyn Brando, in the Hollywood film, The Ugly American, in which Brando played the morally compromised American ambassador to the Indochinese nation of Sarkhan, while Kukrit played the country's prime minister. Kukrit became increasingly involved in politics himself. He founded a conservative political party and was elected to parliament, then actually became prime minister of Thailand in real life, in 1975 to 76. You can't make this stuff up. While he was in office, he mediated conflicts between rightists and leftists, and he kept a wary distance both from China and from the United States at the close of the Vietnam War. When an interviewer asked him how Thailand had avoided the domino effect when Vietnam and then Cambodia were taken over by China-backed co communists, Cooker replied, we don't belong to the same set of dominoes. Perhaps we play cards. Cooker was a major presence in Thai literature and politics for several decades. And his newspaper gave him a base of operation in both arenas. One year after founding Siam Rat, he began serializing Four Reigns in his paper uh, in 1951. The novel came out in book form in 53. With Four Reigns and many other works, Kukrit gradually developed a substantial reputation beyond his own country. In 1990, he was one of the first recipients, recipients of the newly established Fukuoka Prize in Japan for contributions to the development of Asian culture at large. Appropriately, Akira Kurosawa was one of the three other recipients that same year. In Four Reigns, uh, Kukrit uses his hero, heroine, Mai Ploy, as his vantage point, and he gives a sensitive portrayal tinged with satire of her struggle to make and then remake her life in a rapidly changing but still stubbornly patriarchal society. Using her apolitical viewpoint enables Kukrit to indirectly critique the growing authoritarianism among the military and business interests after 1932. One way the ploy experiences the effects of the new government order is through their dictates on what she can wear. One of her sons has, brought into the, has bought into the new regime and his propaganda. As World War II commences, he proudly tells his mother that Thailand nowadays, he says, seems to be acting as big as Japan, the great power. The son says that to complete the process of catching up to Japan, Thailand must adopt culture, watanatam, a neologism in Thai. When ploy asks what that word means, her son replies, it means we must wear hats. Floyd, who's now middle-aged, says that young women might like trying on some new fashion, but this would make her feel like a clown. To this, her son makes a chilling reply. Clown or no clown, you'll have to do it, my girl. She says, and if I don't, he replies, the police will get you. My Ploy has little understanding of politics, and so she rarely criticizes what she sees happening. 
But here is elsewhere, Kukra takes the opportunity to suggest his views in the very process of having his heroine not understand the regime's dictates. His novel is subtly but deeply anti-authoritarian. He portrays the oligarchic coup against the monarchy as cloaked in Orwellian euphemism. The coup, is, the coup is only a change of system, a manifestation of progress and an advancement of democracy, a term that the brothers cannot agree how to translate into Thai. So Kukrit is a writer of considerable interest from many points of view. And yet he has never received the attention that's been given to his Indonesian counterpart, Pramodja Ananta Tor. Both write ambitious multi-generational novels that encapsulate the development of the modern nation. Kukrit's Four Reigns can well be compared to Pramodya's four-volume Budo Quartet, from questions of politics to language to clothing. They even both have chapters uh, depicting a sudden fad for bicycles. With this rich portrayal of the coming of modernity to Indonesia, the Budo Quartet figures prominently in a range of post-colonial studies. Uh, Feng Chia's earlier book, Spectral Nationality, Peter Hitchcock's The Long Space, Space, Transnationalism, Postcolonial New Form, Christopher Gogwild's Passage of Literature, Genealogy of Modernism, Conrad, Reese, and Primogia. Uh, all of those uh, devote substantial space to Primogia. He figures prominently also in Benedict Anderson's writing. Whereas Kukrit is not mentioned by any of them, or so far as I know, in any scholarly study at all outside Thailand. Now, a writer needs influential champions to be known worldwide what uh, William Marling has called gatekeepers in his recent book on uh, Garcia Marquez and others on that theme. Now, Benedict Anderson did a lot to draw Anglophone post-colonial attention to Southeast Asia. And Kukrit's standing in post-colonial studies might well be higher if Anderson had showcased him in his books together with Pamoja. Anderson specialized, in fact, in Thai as well as Indonesian politics, language, and culture. And he published a collection of modern Thai stories shortly after he published Imagine Communities. Kukrit would have been a perfect figure to take up in that book, given Anderson's emphasis on the role of newspapers together with novels in creating the imagined communities of the modern nation. Here, Kukrit is the founder of a major modern newspaper uh, in Thailand. Yet neither Anderson nor anyone else outside Thailand has ever discussed Kukrit's novels and stories, to my knowledge. Kukrit was a self-consciously modern writer, kind of feminist, a skeptically engaged observer of political and social change. But he seems to have had two strikes against him. He was a royalist rather than a leftist, and he was a Buddhist rather than a secularist. His Buddhism comes to the fore uh, in his book, Many Lives, very well translated, also recommend, along with Four Reigns. It's a linked set of short stories that trace the karmic paths that lead each character onto a ferry boat that sinks him at a storm on the Chao Praia River that runs through Bangkok. The final lines of Four Reigns also portray my ploy, uh, her death in distinctly Buddhist terms. And I quote, it was in the late afternoon of that Sunday, the 9th of June, 1946, when the tide was low on Klong Bang Long, the, the ploy's heart stopped beating, and her transient joys and suffering in this life came to an end. Klong Bang Long is a tributary canal of the Chao Praia River. On the opening page of the novel, Ploy had ventured down river from her home along the canal, sent by her mother to seek her fortune as an attendant in the royal court. On the novel's final page, 600 pages later, Situating a very specific and traumatic day uh, uh, under, under the aegis of eternity, for rain beautifully comes full circle. That's the day on which the Rama the Eighth either committed suicide or was accidentally killed or was assassinated. No one knows to this day. Benedict Anderson was actually well aware of Kukrit's work, but it gave him only a single footnote in the 75 page introduction to Thai literature and politics in his anthology of Thai stories called In the Mirror. In his footnote, he mentions Four Reigns as a significant novel, but the writers whom Anderson chooses for his collection are all younger, subversive, and non-conforming figures. Those are his phrases, whose work was shaped by the reading of Western Marxists and Asian Maoists. A novel that Anderson himself describes as significant deserves attention even if it's written by a Buddhist royalist, if we want to better understand the interwoven strands of literary modernity in Thailand and beyond. We need to find better ways to include major authors from minor traditions, as well as minor authors from major traditions. So here, Tolkien and Kukrit are strangely uh, united in their neglect by comparatists and post-colonial scholars. The most best-selling author in the world and a very local author, uh, very little known out of his country, nonetheless, suffer similarly. 
In the process, we need to rethink the categories of major and minor themselves. The long established two-tiered model of major and minor authors itself has shifted in, uh, in recent years. Few of the old major authors have ascended what can be called a hyper canon, the equivalent of increasing wealth of the 1% in many societies around the world. Or on the analogy of the socioeconomic classes, the category of the major author can be divided to upper major writers, lower major writers. Meanwhile, the category of the minor can be supplemented by a category of ultra minor figures. I will this term to the Faroese comparatist Berger Moberg, who coined it in regard to very small countries or language communities uh, such as uh, his own. Uh, Berger and I went on to co edit a special issue, the Journal of World Literature, on the topic. In this issue, I should say, we included an essay on contemporary Sanskrit poetry as a form of ultra minor writing. And we also published an essay by Bhavya Tiwari, who received her MA in comparative literature from Jadavpur before she went on to do her PhD and teach in the US. Her, her essay was on the novel Chimim uh, by the Malayalam uh, writer T.S. Pillai. Then uh, Tiwari and I subsequently co edited a special issue of the Journal of World Literature on world literature and post colonial literature. We received so many good contributions that we expanded it to two issues. Her own first book is now forthcoming from Bloomsbury Academic under the title Beyond English, World Literature uh, and India. So to sum up, there's a couple of things here. One second, let me see how I want to sum up. Uh, it appears that post-colonial studies, as much as the older world literary masterpieces world, has reproduced the hyper-canonical bias of the old Europe-based field. So if it always used to be Dante and Goethe, now it's always uh, Gasse and Marquez and Salman Rushdie. Uh, this, is, this is a certain change, but it's not a fundamental shift in, in the, the range of attention being given to, uh, to the true variety of works today. We're often drawn to write about works with which we feel ourselves in sympathy, but it would mean a tremendous impoverishment of literary studies if we only study contemporary world literature, even more if the only contemporary works we're studying are novels and only novels by or about migrants and only within that micro canon uh, uh, would be uh, in writers as rich and complex as Michael Ondaatje or Amitav Ghosh would be their critiques of imperialism or capitalism. A whole new panorama of modernity opens up as we begin to look beyond the usual suspects. Of course, a history of literary modernity that would include four reigns at the cost of suppressing the magnificent brutal quartet, or that would include Tolkien and drop Gatia Marquez would be no improvement at all. But it's important also to include a figure such as Kukra Pramod in our accounts precisely because he doesn't fit neatly into the narratives that Western critics and often critics elsewhere typically want to create for literature of the third world, the global south, the post-colony, the world system, or the periphery, all of which are terms of varied connotation, but similar singularity. What we need are pluralistic studies that admit materials that challenge and modify the aesthetic, political, and historiographic frameworks we, begin, we bring to them. This is the best way to practice what the Sanskritist Sheldon Pollock has called a comparison without hegemony. As we build our glass houses, and what the troubled narrator Promodius House of Glass describes as that new jungle called the modern age. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for uh, such a brilliant talk. And I strongly believe that it will open uh, many new directions of further research. Uh, sir, if you have time, uh, may we have a brief discussion session? Absolutely. Uh, Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, if uh, uh, Aratrika and Kingshu, if we have any question from the participants, then we can uh, put forward the questions. The uh, yes, uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Pramnik, and thank you, Professor Dambos, for this splendid lecture. Uh, we have some questions, I think, from YouTube. Uh, I'll take one now. Yes, we have uh, some questions. Uh, the first question is from. Obhinava Moitro is asking, can we see Tolkien's stories as manifestation of the various unique languages he tried to create rather than just a fantasy? That's absolutely uh, a great, great issue, really quite fascinating question. Um, as you know, and this relates also to the whole issue of uh, multilingualism and 
English uh, because he was, of course, creating the, the he created in particular Elvish. Uh, and on his in his title page, you have you have runes and you have El, you have dwarf runes and you have Elvish scripts and two different scripts, which are actually not in those languages, but is simply English transliterated. And if you read, you can actually read it. Uh, and it says this is the this is the uh, the Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien based on the Red Book of Westmarch. It's very it's very funny. So his his very title page is is monolingual but tri scriptural, which is quite interesting. And he developed the whole uh, I, Elvish language, of course, long before he uh, and, he, and he, these language systems. So he, he's very fascinated with, with multilingualism uh, and opening out to to a wider world. And of course, Gandalf the Grey uh, deciphers the, the, this the story of the Ring. Uh, in, in the library of Minas Tirith, because he can read these old scripts and these languages that no one else can read anymore. Uh, so absolutely, uh, this is, uh, it is a feature and it's, it's a, a commonality with, with the, the presence of Sanskrit in uh, Garcia Marquez as well. Thank you, Professor. We yeah. have another question from the audience. Uh, it's called Pooja Sancheti. Uh, Pooja is asking, uh, would you argue that world literature is primarily an ethical project of equality equal space? And law anthology or history of world literature is ever complete and only ever expanding. Um, and and is that a statement or a question? I wasn't quite sure. Uh, uh, it is, can you it is a question, question, I think. Uh, can, can you rephrase yeah, it? She's a bit asking, could you argue that uh, world literature is primarily an ethical project of Equality equal space and not anthology or history of all literature is ever complete, and it is, is it only ever expanding? I think she was asking that. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a very nice point, which uh, you know is a very much of a challenge for us because, in a certain sense, uh, it is an incredibly expansive uh, period of the study of world literature, uh, which used to be fifty years ago. It really meant the literatures. This term primarily re re referred to a few literature as major in Western European uh, countries, perhaps with also a little bit of East-West comparison of, of uh, uh, Sanskrit literature, but not probably modern Indian literature, uh, classical Chinese and, and Japanese. Uh, and now we have, we have everything. Uh, so whether it's um, uh, Pillai's Chimim uh, or um, uh, I recently read the, um, um, you know, I mean, all kinds of, uh, kinds of works are here. Then it's a challenge of how you deal with it, whether in anthologies or courses, because um, anthologies only have so many pages they can have, and courses still only have so many weeks. Uh, so there is a persistent tendency, and I think increases the tendency of also world literature scholars to fall back on, on a few favorite works and miss so many others. So I think it's a challenge for us, um, not just ideologically, but also pragmatically to find ways to I think to, to bring together in anthologies or in courses or in our scholarship, you know, a vital mix of widely talked about figures with people who have been left on the margins and bring them back into the discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have, uh, I have a uh, question and uh, comment also, my observation also. And when you were talking about Indonesian literature and Thai literature, I was uh, getting fascinated by the, by the instances, examples. And I would like to share something with you that Professor Shuniti Kumar Chatterjee, uh, who had been teaching at the University of Calcutta, he actually once uh, visualized, I mean, envisioned the idea of Prihatar of Bharat or Greater India with reference to Indian ancient culture and the text like the Ramayana and Mahabharata and its journey towards Southeast Asia. And this is how he was imagining a greater Indian literary map. And later we found that there are actually two layers in India or, or, or any other uh, literary canon also that when we are talking about world literature, there is one concept of world literature in English, which is formed in English language and English academia. And there are quite contradictory sometimes or different ideas of world literature in different Indian bhashas, Indian languages, other than English. For example, if we can take uh, example of Bangla or Hindi or Telugu or Malayalam, we can observe that the, the, the incident of war migration, continuous displacement, uh, 
solidarity uh, literary translation in solidarity to the war victim formed continuously new horizons of world literature but the saddest part of the story is that indian languages other than english hardly studies acad uh, world literature in academic discipline so it is a challenge to us to connect between these two world literature world literature in english and world literature in indian languages and when we are talking about world literature in our academic discipline when we are teaching in bilingual mode and addressing both the students coming from english and coming from indian bhasha it is quite challenging to us to connect and to address these two so sir uh, i mean can you suggest something that how these two or many worlds of world literature can be connected in the classroom teaching of world literature and that's a dynamite question <clears throat> and one that certainly engages me a lot uh, having done this big anthology of world literature with a number of friends including uh, Sheldon Pollock as as uh, one of our editors Uh, you know, no one has time to teach 6,000 pages of that anthology, and I increasingly feel that that less is more, uh, especially in the classroom. I mean, ideally, people can read more, but there's not so much time. And I think uh, I put increasing emphasis on just a really um, it puts a lot of um, uh, burden on us as teachers to think now what can I bring into a classroom that's uh, two or three works, poems, short stories. Occasionally, a novel when there's time, you know, that will really bring these things uh, to life. Um, and I think we have, at the same time, also I think we all need to be very much activists about translation. We need to be getting works translated, circulated, and that can even be part for the class. It can go online, all kinds of things uh, like that. Um, I think all of us have to just uh, take time to do that. I remember that uh, Bavia Tuari, whose book I mentioned, which is forthcoming there, Beyond English. Uh, she talks about Tagore as a world writer, and one of the things she notes is that almost all translations in India of Tagore's works are done from the English translation of his works. Relatively few are directly from Bengali into the other languages, uh, which you know makes no sense, uh, but is happening. Uh, and you know anyone can can strive against that, but but not just give in unthinkingly to to the convenience for publishers saying, oh yeah, you know we get someone to do this. Um, Now I was going to go on to some logical point that followed directly um, from that, but it will come come back to me. Uh, so, so I think that um, as you're saying, world literature takes a very different shape and very different understanding in uh, in different parts of the world. There's no such thing as world literature. There are world literatures, and any one. And a big point for me these days, increasingly in my more recent work since the What Is World Literature book, is that. Uh, In practice, world literature is what is available in any given market. I'm mean, increasingly, you know, what is translated, what is taught, what can readers find, what are writers reading. That's what world literature is for them. And of course, it will be different um, uh, in Orissa than it will be in Delhi, and then it will be in uh, uh, Burma, you know, or Myanmar, completely different, or, or you know, some overlap but very substantially different. And we need to take account of that. And then, with, with that in mind, the selection of writers. How will a given work like the Pillai novel Chimene, you know, how does it relate to the world around it? Or I was recently reading this uh, novel translated as One Part Woman by uh, Parma Murugan, who's now got several books coming out in, in Penguin just in the last couple of years. So it's now possible uh, to, to find works that were just completely hidden. It wasn't you know, all Tagore and Rushdie anymore at all. So I think it's a, a very exciting time, but also to think what sort of uh, carefully targeted selections will show that dynamic interplay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. We have, we have few more questions, sir. Uh, yeah. Dr. Pramil, should I read it out? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yes, uh, one of the question from, uh, one is from uh, one of our co-founders, Pratim. Uh, Pratim is asking, uh, what accounts as a Southeast Asian literary classic? Is there a canon? Although do existing theories of world literature apply to the context of this region? So this is, uh, it's a good question of, a, of canons and canonicity is a very complicated thing uh, because uh, any given tradition will have some canon or sometimes competing canons there within it. 
readers from outside may want to adopt that canon or may have a rather different understanding uh, of what will work for them. So, you know, part of our, of our responsibility and the pleasure as scholars is to look around and find and think strategically, you know, of the works that are current there, what is going to speak to a broader audience? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a big theme with, with me that works of world literature are, are works that do well abroad. Uh, it's not necessarily a question that they're, they're not better than works that don't do well abroad per se, but they're works that, uh, that are legible without needing so much local information that you can't appreciate it if you don't uh, read them uh, in the original, that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think that we have to look, so like uh, Kukrit, for example, uh, is relative and neglected also in Thailand because by and large, the scholars who work on modern Thai literature are on the left and they view him as this oh, old guy, old conservative, not what we like uh, to read at all. Uh, but now to me looking at it, uh, it's as interesting as Pramodja is, right? And I've read some other Thai works, but this one uh, struck me now as the most interesting thing to think about for the problem that I'm, uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, but I think also it does mean uh, talking to people, uh, reaching out. And I, and I also really hope it means that comparatives will really work hard on learning more languages. Uh, I remember that uh, Shel Sheldon Pollock once remarked uh, when he was doing that, that big collection of uh, literary cultures and history or essays on all kinds of Indian literatures that he himself ended up having to, to work up his knowledge of two different literatures because he couldn't find a scholar who really had a comprehensive knowledge of that tradition. And he, and he said something like, you know, well, the old Orientalists had a lot uh, to answer for, but at least they learned the damn languages. Uh, and I think this is a, you know, it's really something, right? So comparative literature in China, um, sorry, comparative literature in India shouldn't just be a matter of English, Hindi, maybe also Bengali, and maybe also one other language, if that's your language, right? You should also learn the other languages beyond the couple of hegemonic ones and the, the immediate one or two at home. I think all of us have a lot to do with that. So I, I would wish uh, in comparative literature departments, uh, let's say if in my department, you have to study three foreign languages beyond, beyond English, um, I would like to say one of them should just always be a language that is understudied, just learn something. It doesn't necessarily have to be from another part of the world, but like, so now we have study students in my department, uh, say um, uh, working in East Asian who will learn Korean as well as Chinese and Japanese or in, in Europe and they're learning Dutch or Norwegian or Catalan, not just French, German, English and Spanish and Italian, which were the only languages before. So I think uh, also the issue of our responsibility as teachers and, and as scholars is to learn some more languages, but then also and promote translation and also just read what's there. There's so much being translated now. You can find a fair number of Thai books translated now, including modern as well as classical works, and then see for yourself what, what connects with other things you're interested in and that you think your readers will be interested in. Yeah, and uh, like as a student of a, a scholar of comparative literature, like, we cannot actually learn so many languages. It's not possible to learn many languages, but translation can be help, really helpful in that. And this is also why translation studies has become so important in comparative yes. literature programs, where when I was a student back in the pre-modern, era of the 70s, there were no courses in translation studies. You were not supposed to read anything in translation. And if you did, you wouldn't admit it. And that meant, of course, you were not reading many, many literatures. Uh, you know, you just translation is absolutely important. This is also why the mixed blessing of global English is very, very useful. Uh, and, and writers are, are you know, often less, less concerned in a way about the hegemony of English than we scholars. I remember uh, or on Pamuk, I was talking to him one point and saying he'd, he'd much rather be uh, translated well uh, through English than not translated at all into another language or translated badly, let's say into Vietnamese. Uh, you know, I'd rather have a good translation through English and therefore because he's fluent in English, he also works over his English language translation sentence by sentence because he knows that half his translation is done through English. And that's a tremendous boon for him, connecting him to other traditions otherwise would never be reading him. Yes, thank you, Professor. And uh, uh, Professor, if you, if you permit, we can take one more question from the audience. Do you have time? Yes. Certainly, I do. Okay. So, uh, Shoykot, uh, Shoykot Saha is asking, uh, is it possible to think about theorizing sentimentality 
which is often takes as a stereotypical feature of non-canonical marginal literature for diversifying world literary criticism. Criticism. So, are you saying sentimental literature? Is that the question? Uh, I'll just repeat it once. Yeah. Is it possible to think about theorizing sentimentality, which is often taken as a stereotypical feature of non-canonical marginal literature for diversifying world literary criticism? Uh, absolutely. And I think that um, in a way, this would be a, a version of what I talk about with, with Tolkien. Uh, that is one of the things that's been a persistent problem for world literature studies is a, is a devotion to traditionally defined canonical masterpieces. Uh, and then popular literature has been viewed as suspect. And very often women's literature has been viewed as somehow not part of the great tradition. Uh, the Norton Anthology of World Masterpiece, which came out in 1956, uh, had not one single page by one woman author, hard to believe. Finally, in the year of the Lord, 1968, they put in two pages by Sappho. That was the only literature by any woman. Uh, and I think that popular literature itself is really, really interesting uh, for world literary studies, um, partly because it requires probably, to some extent, different modes of reading. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the popular genre fiction may not uh, uh, reward the kind of close reading of the sort that you might give to Tolstoy, uh, but then there are different ways of framing it and different ways of, of, of thinking about it. So absolutely, I think that one of the things we, we can be doing is opening out our, our studies that way. And I should say also, increasingly, I'm starting to teach uh, film as well as graphic uh, novels in, in my courses. Uh, and you know, we're, literary scholars tend to be far behind the culture in seeing where narrative is being produced today. Thank you, Professor. Uh, like, personally, I'd love to ask a question or two. Uh, one is actually from uh, King Shuk. Uh, he, he's asking, like, uh, actually, even I want to ask you this. Uh, what are like, your views on uh, how post, in the post, post-colonial era, how the global, how global English is changing? Like, what, what's the future of it? Like, is it going to, like, you know, kind of becoming a, will it become a hegemony, the language of hegemony and dominate over, like, all the languages? Uh, you know, I think yeah. it is why it is a mixed blessing. Uh, I think, um, and it's part of our opportunity and challenge as scholars who are fluent in English to to make critical and good use of it and not be simply confined by it. I, I, I sort of a little polemic running through the book I published last year on comparing the literatures uh, is that Anglophone scholars tend to to restrict the world to what available to them in English. Uh, which is very peculiar to me. So that, um, uh, and I gave the example of the work collective that discusses no work of criticism uh, outside English and not even the original text of the works they're talking about, they're written in other language. That seems to me, particularly for a politically progressive group, quite bizarre. They're succumbing to that domination of global English, even as they think they're working against the neoliberal hegemonic market. But, uh, but it's also the case that we as scholars rarely look comparatives who can read other languages, rarely use them, except maybe in the language that they're, it's their sort of home base. I, and I look a little bit, for example, at um, a couple of uh, Brazilian scholars, Roberto Schwartz, whom Franco Moretti uses, and, and, and Schwartz is a mentor, Antonio Candido, who was never discussed, very important writer. Uh, and in my own book, I, I talk about scholars from writing in, in Portuguese and Italian uh, and, and Catalan, as well as Spanish and French and German, and then in translation, talk about scholars writing in Chinese and, and Japanese. But it's amazing to me how, how rarely these, these scholars who aren't translated into English get, get read and by people who should be able to read the, the languages that they're, uh, that they're working in. Uh, so the global English um, is a wonderful thing for us if we use it well and don't just get trapped by it ourselves. Uh, I mean, it's an example, I mean, not only our thing here, but this Institute for World Literature that's now in its 10th year. Um, I remember when we met in Hong Kong a few years ago, uh, my, uh, my friend and host there, Zhang Longxi, I said, oh, would he like to have some of the seminars be in Chinese? And he said, no, he didn't want to ghettoize the Chinese speakers. It should all be in English. And uh, a thing like that, which brings together people regularly from you know, 30 countries, could not exist without the common language. So it's extremely helpful. And as I say, it's extremely helpful for writers who, who circulate through it successfully. Uh, 
uh, a good, my, my favorite discussion of this is uh, the, the linguist David Crystal, who wrote an excellent book called English as a Global Language now 20 years ago. And he's a kind of a Welsh uh, nationalist, a Welsh uh, advocate for Welsh language and culture, but he's a linguist. A linguist. He says, you know, his ideal is that everyone will have, because English has become de facto the common language, particularly of scholarship uh, and of much uh, of the economy, it's good for if everyone will, will have a good knowledge of English and a vital knowledge of, uh, of another language, one or more languages. They said it'd be a great thing uh, for English to be used for the promotion of all these other languages and cultures uh, worldwide. And that's exactly what comparatives are, are, are well able to do. Now you're muted there. Yeah, 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 it's okay now, yeah. Uh, Nita, also, I, I want to know, like, uh, what do you think, uh, if there can be any alternative term for the term, like, Global South, because, as you said, it talks about, uh, it promotes a kind of singularity. Like, can we use an alternative term for Global South or, no, any uh, term related to the Global South term? All that's I mean, thing. my main feeling is any version of a, of a term that could be made plural will be better than any one that's singular. Uh, so... Uh, it'll be interesting to see what people come up with, which is also why world literature is, I mean, it doesn't bother me that you have an overall category such as literature, as long as you, you know that there are then many different literatures. So too, uh, these, different, uh, these different locations. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what new coinages come up. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Pramnik, if you have like, something to add to. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think we, are, we are almost, uh, uh, about to reach the time uh, what we are uh, supposed to uh, take from uh, Professor uh, David Damrush. So if we do not have much question, then we can conclude the session. Uh, we don't have much question from YouTube. Uh, so yes, but the video will be there. So participants can feel free to post their questions later also. The viewers can post their questions later as well. Yeah. Let me thank you both uh, and you all for, for this very kind invitation and to everyone for those very good questions. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your this brilliant lecture. And it is actually, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, it, 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 it will help us for further research and teaching world literature and thinking on world literature also as always, as we are always learning from you and your works. So many, many thanks for uh, giving us this time and such beautiful lecture and coming over to this platform of Calcutta Comparatives 1990. Many, many thanks, sir. Truly my pleasure. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Thank like, you, sir. And uh, so many texts you have mentioned from Taib Sali to uh, like, uh, and so many texts that like, you no, know, it kind of revis we revisited our old, it, it just brought back some nostalgia of all the grad undergrad days and everything. Thank you for that also, Tolkien and everything. Thank you so much. And Dr. Banerjee, and good to see you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now okay. I yes, conclude the session officially. Uh, Prati, are you here? Or... There's a network issue. Okay, so uh, on behalf of Calcutta Comparatist 1919 and its members, I'd like to convey our hearty thanks to Professor David Damrosh for his excellent lecture on the topic literary studies in post post-colonial era. A big thank you to Professor for sharing your ideas and views on this area. I'd like to express our gratitude to you, sir, for responding to us and coming to our forum. We're really honored with this lecture and we are really inspired by your great words. And thanks to all our audience on YouTube for being with us today. And here we officially conclude this session now. And also thank you, Dr. Pramani, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks. Bye, sir.